Entrepreneurs and small business owners, are you feeling overwhelmed by lack of capital, growth challenges, or personal branding? You are not alone. UCS Advisors is here for you. We're professional capital raising advisors committed to helping you secure funding and grow your business. Are you ready to impress investors? Check your investor readiness with our free 45 second quiz at ucsquiz.com. We believe in you. Visit ucsquiz.com and start your success journey. And remember, always be willing to achieve your greatness. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Greetings from the Garden State. I'm your host, Mike Cam. We are here at Cedar Rose Vineyards in Rosenhain with Devin Perry and Dustin Tarpine. Guys, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Uh, I'm glad to be here. And I think I told you guys, I know I told you guys off mic before when we're getting a little tour, that this is, I'm pretty sure this is my first time ever actually at a vineyard. And what what better place to start than one that's right here in Jersey? That's right. Yeah. That's a lot of pressure though. It is a lot of pressure. (laughs) Yeah. You have like big shoes to fill because we need, like we always hit with great episodes every single week. So I'm I'm sure this is going to go great. Oh yeah. So far our conversations have been off the charts. Yeah. I'm not worried. Yeah. Me neither. (laughs) I need some clarification. Your first time at a vineyard anywhere, not just a vineyard in New Jersey. My life. I didn't realize that we were talking about this earlier. Yeah. I mean, like I've frequented my share of breweries and distilleries for sure, but Mm -hmm. this is just like a totally different vibe Mm and experience, you know, because just like I just took a cool picture, like going down one of the rows of the of the vines and just like it's so peaceful out Mm -hmm. here and just like a totally different world. So uh, I was like, you guys, I just told you, like, I live up in Morristown. Mm -hmm. So this is about like a two hour drive for me. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, South Jersey to me is kind of like its own animal (laughs) compared to North Jersey. Um, But then you have like places like this. There are places like this in North Jersey, but I feel like you get things like this a little bit more often down here. Mm-hmm. Um, just like these cool spots that have, you know, like a lot of things to do and people can visit and try stuff and stuff that's grown right here. Yeah. No, do you kind of forget you're in New Jersey sometimes when you come down this far south? Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, the views and the open spaces and you know, the population density is so much lower down here. Sure. Um, but it's a good place to grow grapes. Yeah. I mean, really is a fantastic place to be growing grapes. Awesome. You know, the soil's good, climate's good, yeah. all that. Um, before we start out with you, even though we've already started, uh, we have a glass of wine on the table mm-hmm. and I want to try it because I'm also a little bit parched. Um, so can you tell us what this is? Sure. Uh, so, uh, it's a nice hot day out today, humid. So I figured I'd pick something refreshing. So, uh, this is called Traminette. And so, uh, Traminette is, uh, it's called a French American hybrid. So it's a cross between a European species and a native American species. And so this one was actually developed at Cornell in, I believe it was in the eighties, I want to say. Okay. Um, but very, so reverse Traminer is very floral. Sometimes it can be like almost like rose, uh, characters in there. Um, but you also get like nice citrusy characters too, but just a really, it grows pretty well in New Jersey. So that's always a big thing for us because we're growing pretty much everything that we make. So it has to do well in the vineyard to end up making it to the glass, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we finish it like just a little bit off dry. So let us get like a touch of sweetness in there. Sure. Um, not too much. And it's just really refreshing. Easy yeah. to drink. Cool. Yeah. Well, and kind of unique to Jersey too. Yeah. Well, cheers. Cheers yeah. to New Jersey wine. <laughs> cheers to New Jersey wine. Thank you for having me here. <clears throat> well, that is really good. A, couple, a few months ago, or beginning of the year really, I had on a sommelier. Okay. And we talked about wine. So I feel like I kind of have a little bit better understanding of like what to look for when I'm actually like tasting and trying wines. Mm-hmm. But um okay, so let's start the episode. So uh Devin, so you and I talked maybe four months ago, yes. three months ago, whatever it was about doing something like this. Um and finally I've made it down. Um but I want to talk a little bit about kind of what you do as like a uh, the broader picture of New Jersey wineries, particularly like here in South Jersey, I would imagine. Is that right? So actually, um, the Garden State Wine Growers Association represents 100% of all vineyards and wineries in the entire state. And I brought this um, for you. Oh, cool. Oh, a map. Great. So this is a map of all active tasting rooms in the state of New Jersey. So um, while we are in a beautiful... in a beautiful location in the middle of what is called the Outer Coastal Plain, American Viticultural Appalachian, um, which for short is AVA. Um, There are four AVAs in the state. So Warren Hills up north, Mm -hmm. the central Delaware Valley, um, which has two relatively new wineries, um, Federal Twist and Angelico, 
the Outer Costa Plain, which does have the lion's share of the wineries located in it. That's everything beautiful and delicious between Philadelphia and Atlantic City. Right. And then the Cape May Peninsula, which is a sub AVA technically of uh, the Outer Coastal Plain. Yeah. No, this is cool. And I see a 55 on here, which is the last one. And it says coming soon in Chester. Yes. So now I'm excited because there'll be one that's really close. Yes. To me. Is that Rebel uh, Sheep? Yes, it was. Yeah. Um, but okay, so let's talk a little bit about kind of the the Garden State Wine Growers Association and kind of like your role and kind of what it encompasses and kind of what you guys do to help support these types of businesses. So the Garden State Wine Growers Association was established in 1987, um, and it is a nonprofit partially funded through the Department of Agriculture. Um, we apply for a grant um, they release annually. We also are partially funded through USDA grants called Specialty Crop Block Grants. Um, and we represent all vineyards and wineries. So we are the promoters. Um, we are the advocates. Um, we work with the press. Um, we handle the social media presence, the website, um, anything from a printed piece to an electronic piece. And what we see coming up and one of the things that we're pro promoting right now genuinely is that we are growing on you. So this idea of you may not be aware that New Jersey wineries are internationally recognized, um, but you're driving past our vineyards every day. Yeah. And so that awareness campaign is really what we're um, trying to drive home, specifically in the Garden State. Yeah. Um, we're happy to also share that our wines uh, were recently tasted at um, the embassies. Uh, the U.S. ambassador to Italy's private residence in Italy. Okay. Um, so the Italian market has a demand for New Jersey wines. So now we just have to tell people close to home. Yeah, no, definitely. And um, I think I was telling you guys before uh, about when we went to like the, the New Jersey Wine Fest or the Morris County Wine Fest yeah. up in Morris County. And I said to you, I was like, I didn't realize like how many different wineries there were yep. um, making stuff here in New Jersey and how good the stuff was mm -hmm. and like just i mean that was it was pouring rain that day i remember <laughs> i remember uh, that too i was yeah. there i was definitely like there, yeah. i was drenched mm -hmm. but we just i mean i was also drunk so it really didn't matter <laughs> um that helps <laughs> uh but um no but that was it was just so cool because like you know like like we said before i mean i've never been to a vineyard period um but like coming down here and kind of now learning more about and just looking at that map you're just like oh my god like there's there's so much to do and visit um, because, you know, I mean, like I don't get down to South Jersey as much as sometimes I may want to. Mm -hmm. Um, but now there's all these reasons to, to do that. And granted they're up North too, but you know, a lot of them down here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the great thing is that while we have the print piece circulated all across the state and in the mid Atlantic, we also have an app. Um, it's just NJ wine in order to download it. It's free and you can create itineraries. Yeah. Um, I did it when I first, um, uh, started working with the association because I went winery to winery um, to meet everybody. Sure. So um, it's a great tool whether you want to use it for yourself for programming purposes um, or bringing a whole group of friends out and about. Yeah. So hopefully people will will find it useful too. Definitely. Um, so you also mentioned in there that you know you as the executive director go around meeting all the different proprietors of all these different vis uh, vineyards and wineries and all that kind of stuff. Um, is there a reason we started here at Cedar Rose? Not playing favorites, of course, <laughs> but, you know, I feel like this is a good place to start. You seem lovely. Well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> you seem lovely as well. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but tell me a little bit about, like, you know, why we're starting here, because I'm, I'm, I have a feeling, and, uh, you know, because once my girlfriend sees any of the pictures that I post or listens to this episode... We will be coming. Oh, yes. I promise you, girlfriend, I will be bringing you to other wineries. <laughs> yeah. So that, you know, given, so she will definitely be to more. But so why why here? Why are we starting here? It's a great question. So um, Dustin happens to be very involved in the Garden State Wine Growers Association. Um, and he also has um, another business. Um, and he'll talk a little bit more about that, um, where there's there's more behind the vines that Dustin can talk about regarding the entirety of the industry. And my hope was truly that we were gonna have this conversation, you were going to get very excited and then we'd meet you up north for maybe our next visit. And okay. I can Listen, schlep you all around the state to wineries. So <laughs> yeah. 
Um, oh, cool. So it's a great place to start because of uh, Dustin's background. Sure. Yeah. We were honored to be first. I mean, you know, I think our story is pretty, you know, everybody's story in the wine industry is unique. And that's kind of the cool part about the people in the wine industry yeah. is yeah. that everyone got into it like pretty intentionally. Like it's, it's a crazy amount of work to be in the wine industry. So it's not something that's taken lightly. So to see people like, you know, like the Daninis, for instance, who are leaving like high powered, you know, lawyer jobs and, you know, corporate positions and different things to come to the wine industry. Um, but the way we got started, I think, was very homegrown, kind yeah. of, you know. Um, I don't know if, you know, we started when we were very young, and, and that's basically all we've been doing pretty much since we got out of college. So sure. we've been, I mean, very much directly integrated into the industry. So it's, um, I feel like I can give you guys a fair amount of insight yeah. on, on what's going on. So, oh, definitely. Yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit. Sure. So as, like, when you started, kind of what got you into it, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So to, to start, you got to go way back to 2009. Um, so I, uh, I went to Clemson. Um, I have a degree from a uh, Bachelor of Science in Horticulture from Clemson. Uh, but to graduate with that degree, you have to do an internship as part of the requirement. And so um, I applied for a bunch of internships, uh, one of which was over at the Rutgers Experiment Station in Seabrook. Um, and I was lucky enough to be placed under a researcher by the name of Dr. Dan Ward. Um, and he's a very, very influential and kind of uh, well-known, well-respected industry member. Uh, he's been very involved with helping uh, the wine industry grow and, and getting information out there and all that stuff. So kind of like one of the best people I could have tutored under, honestly. Um, you know, I just kind of happened to land there. Um, but he was an awesome guy in the sense that he got me excited about it. You know, he, he actually brought me to all the industry events. He introduced me to all the players in the industry. He, you know, engaged me with conversation about viticulture and, and winemaking and that sort of stuff. Um, so I worked there basically for the summer of 2009 as an internship, just doing like, you know, hand labor for the most part. I mean, yeah. just going out moving vines around, pruning, doing things like that. Um, but even just that was like cool enough for me to kind of be semi-interested, yeah. you know, um, because up until that point, I had not had any good wine in my entire life. So uh, we were talking a little bit beforehand, but yeah, you know, Franzia is about the, the, the most advanced level yellowtail, maybe if you put that above Franzia, <laughs> but yeah, maybe. Yeah. I, I just uh, liked, when we talked about this inside. Yeah. I like taking the bag out. Oh yeah. 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 No, we, at our fraternity yeah. parties, they would be hung around the oh, basement yeah. Yeah, and they just, like an <laughs> yeah, that's, exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what it, yeah. So that was my experience with wine. Um, so when I actually had a good glass of wine in front of me, I was like blown away because yeah. I just, I don't know. For me, it was like, it's such an authentic representation of like, of the region of the year. There's so much like truth in winemaking, in my opinion, because it's like, you can fake it, you know, you can always fake things and spoofulate things. But when you really do it right, where you grow it somewhere, you make it properly, it really does truly tell the story of the region and of the year that it was grown in. Yeah. And it's that kind of thing. Like, you know, I love, you know, I love beer and you were saying you love beer and we have a saying in the wine industry that it takes a lot of good beer to make good wine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's interesting too, just starting to cut you off. Yeah, no, you're good. Like, like we were talking a little bit kind of just like, uh, if a place like this falls under the same like restrictions that we spoke mm -hmm. about the agricultural side and all of it. Um, to me, that's very interesting too, because like, if you make a bad batch of beer, mm -hmm. you dump it, you start over, yeah. you just go mm -hmm. like, this is if you have a bad batch, like you're screwed until the, the next, next year. Yeah. yeah. You have the a whole entire year. Out. Yeah. So the harvest is, is a crazy time specifically for that reason. Cause you cannot slip up. Yeah. I mean, you have to be on point doing what you need to do, but that's also the, the allure of it for me is sure. because like beer, like you can buy the same ingredients and, and make it the same way with the same process as mash at the same temperature, pop at the, you know, like the boil the same length of time, all that stuff. And you're going to end up with a pretty similar product every time. But in winemaking, you are literally truly capturing the essence of that year yeah. in that bottle. So I'm, cool. you know, and, and, yeah. and, and once that is gone, it's gone forever. Sure. You know, I mean, once all those bottles have been drunk or opened, I mean, that, story that that bottle told of the year and what it went through is literally gone yeah. so it's this weird ephemeral thing that's just uh it kind of that's what kind of grabbed me was just like the fact that oh oh you can actually grow it here these varieties and then you can grow the same varieties here and they're totally different yeah treat them exactly the same way and they're totally different so just that like that truth that was there of right. just like you do these things because there's just so much like so much is inflated in our world nowadays with marketing. Everything is just so inflated. And it's just to find something that was very concrete of mm -hmm. just like, you do this, you get this, and this is what happens. And have it be true yeah. pretty much everywhere. That was the thing that kind of grabbed me originally. Yeah, was yeah. was that I just, I loved that about it. And the fact that it was just like, you have one chance to make it, you make this thing. And then it's just this unique product that you have yeah. for a, a limited amount of time, you know. And you hit on something too. In our state, I think we, have, we grow over 80 varieties mm -hmm. of grapes. Yeah. 
So for such an adorable, I would never know. no, and <laughs> for such an adorable state that um, is is compact and like the inverse of you know Big Brother California and that wine industry, yeah. we can go head to head not just with um, the varietals that are grown in the United States and the wines that are made here, but internationally, people compare some of the wines to um, the Bordeaux region in France. Um, so it's it's interesting and awesome to hear Dustin talk about his passion behind, you know, the winemaking process and what got him into it, considering that the two of you share your love of beer together. Yeah. Mm. Um, but another thing that differentiates the wine industry in, in the state from um, um, our friends in the beverage industry is that we have a three acre mandate to grow. Right. Um, and we have to have our tasting rooms right on top of our three acres and it's contiguous. So it's got to be right, you know, next to one another. If there's a street, in between that's not contiguous. So there are a lot of things that um, are required of our industry that are really unique to our industry. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I mean, like it's farming it, to, to a degree. I mean, yeah. Not just to a degree, it really is. Yeah. Um, and then obviously like the manufacturing of it as well. Manufacturing the right word? Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Production, uh, manufacturing, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. But I mean, we, generally we usually say, anyone I, I feel who knows what they're talking about would say that the wine is made in the vineyard. Right. Um, you know, just about 80%, we usually, I usually hear that number thrown around, about 80% of the final quality of any batch of wine is coming from there. So right. like a great winemaker can't take crappy fruit and make good wine out of it. He yeah. can maybe save it and make something that can be sold that's reasonable, but you're never going to make it. Get your vibe for a little yeah, because you're not going to make the great thing. You know right. what I mean? The, the thing that's blowing people away that, like, you can't even believe was produced. Like, you're not going to make, you're gonna only, only going to make that from the best grapes and the best years and the best vintages. Yeah. And so that's another thing that makes it really intriguing is that, like, when you do have those years and you know it, you have to, like, really perform because right. it's like, that's, it's go time. <laughs> and I think it's very interesting, too, because as we're talking about, you know, like, wineries in the state and then what you guys do, and we're going to get a little bit more into the history here in mm -hmm. a second, but... Um, one of the things you told me when we were taking the tour is that like every grape that goes into your wine mm -hmm. is grown here. Yep, that's and, right. And you know, like to me, one of the questions I was going to ask is like, what happens if you have like a really like this summer has been really bizarre, especially mm -hmm. up north, like the heat and the thunderstorms. And I'm I'm not sure if it's been the same. Probably it's like been pretty summer. weird. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And obviously, like that affects your business so directly. Oh yeah, which is, like, terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, but like to me, that's really cool because mm -hmm. it's like you know, it's no nonsense. Like you literally, you come here, you could try it, and then you could see. Like you walked over there, you put, you grab some grapes, you know, yeah. very simple form, but grab some grapes and just went back there, and boom, now we're drinking it. Yep. Like that yeah. to me is <laughs> almost like mind blowing. <laughs> um, and it's so simple, but it's like so, like you said, like it's like there's like a beauty to it. Yeah. Um, it kind of like ties it all together and makes you feel like you're a part of something. Yeah. No, I mean, really, I mean, that glass of wine. So the Traminet block is over in that other block over there. So yeah. literally, that started there, it went here, and it now it's right here. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, <laughs> that's that is something that I love about it too. And that was. That was a big thing for us, like being like, you know, so we, me and my business partner, Steve Becker, we grew up literally right down the street from here. So, I mean, very much like Jersey boys, Jersey, you know, Jersey born. And uh, we wanted to make sure that was a big cornerstone of what we were doing. Sure. Um, just no, nothing from out of state. Because if at this point for us, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, we have a big vineyard. We have 20 acres, you know, we're fortunate in that sense because not everybody has the, that kind of scale. And so they do have to source other things. So no hate on anybody who has to buy stuff from out of state. You know, because I know it's it's a it's absolutely a requirement for some wineries because there's actually not that much fruit available in New Jersey, yeah. surprisingly. Jersey grown fruit because right. it's almost all spoken for. So most of the wineries that are producing their own fruit are making wine from that fruit. So they don't have a whole lot to sell. Okay. Um, there's a there's only really a few vineyards, and there's some of the ones we like we talked about with the other company that we work with um, that just produce grapes and just sell grapes. But there's not very many. So. Um, it is, there are times that people just literally can't get their hands on Jersey grown stuff. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and I, what I also think is interesting, uh, cause obviously like if you and I just did this interview, it would be very like Cedar Rose specific, but mm -hmm. I love that you're also here Yeah, because it, it is interesting to me too, because like we've had, I think, so this week we posted an episode with a brewery. So three breweries on so far, one distiller with like a couple more to come. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, you know, it's a very similar type of industry. Like there are certain things that they're trying to get pushed and you know, legislation, like all that kind of stuff. But um, here, because it's like a little bit different and there's obviously like, I, I don't know if there is on like the beer side or the, you know, distillery side, but there's like a whole association that's built around all 
of you guys. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I think you said before, like a rising tides type of thing where it's like very, it seems to me, and I'm sure there's, you know, everybody's competitive to a degree, um, but kind of like a, like that environment because like if, you know, one of you or a lot of you are struggling, then everyone else is struggling. Right, exactly. It's a big thing. Yeah, the wine world's a unique place I think for industry like that, because we're not really, the competition's really not here. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's, I mean, as far as the actual demographics go in New Jersey, there's so many people in New Jersey. Mm-hmm. If I think it's something like one, less than 1% of all the wine drinkers in New Jersey drink Jersey wine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, and we're all running businesses. Right. So if you get to 2%, right. <laughs> you know, then we're fine. So really the competition, honestly, is just making sure that the quality of our wines stand up against all of those other international regions. So like when you take Bordeaux and do, you know, or, or other places like that, you know, our, our wines as a whole, you know, because the, the writers won't even come here and, and no one's going to even give us a look if the perception isn't that, oh, the quality's there, mm-hmm. you know? So yeah. that's, and that's the thing is that it, it takes the whole industry to do that because there's a lot of wineries in New Jersey, you know, if everyone's not doing a good job, you know, people could go to one winery or two wineries here and, you know, so it's better for everybody if, Everyone does well. Correct. So that no matter yeah. where any any reporters, media people go, or anyone who wants to write about it or learn about the wine industry, customers, whoever, they get a good experience no matter where they go. Yeah. And I think that's Hands way down. more important. What's nice, too, about what Dustin's saying is, you know, we're, we're one tank of gas away from over 43 million people. And so almost every um, consumer product category markets right here where we are. Yeah. So if we can do a good job, um, identifying how to improve the quality of the bottle, um, identifying ways to create an awesome experience when you come to our properties and helping one another to elevate, I think we are going to be such a force because we do work collaboratively to your point. Yeah. Our board meeting and our full member meeting was yesterday and with a, a little over 60 wineries and vineyards in the state, we have such a powerful opportunity because we really are a small group um, to work together to make sure that we get that word out there so more people come to visit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, just looking at the time, we're going to save like the, the background and the history and kind of like so the, the, next right. the next segment. Um, so I'm going to hit you with this question. Sure. As far as like, so you talk about like marketing to different, you know, markets. Um, you know, like obviously you have New Jersey and New York City and Philly, like all within like a very close radius. Yep. Um, and then like on a distribution level, because obviously, you know, like when I go to my local liquor store, there's like a New Jersey, you know, local craft beer thing, yeah. a local, you know, wine, uh, you know, section too. Mm-hmm. Um, like talk to me a little bit about that, like making sure that your products are getting out in front of people. Yeah. And doing that. I'm sure that's like the next piece of the puzzle because you could... Yep pour wine all day here but i would imagine getting people to be aware of your product is like a totally other absolutely yeah and i mean it's it's great for exposure and stuff we can get out into those stores so so currently we do a bit of wholesaling we're self-distributed so we don't go through a distributor we do all the distribution from here um but we're in about 150 liquor stores around the state um the challenge in the industry like really interesting thing that i find in liquor stores is that if you put craft beers in the liquor store and they can be relatively pricey craft beers yeah People buy them. Yeah. I mean, customers, like, they buy them. It doesn't, it, all it has to be is almost new. You know, if it's new and you know it's some brewery you heard about that was really cool, you know, because I, like I said, I'm a beer drinker myself. I know I'm subject to this, you know? Yeah. Um, I spent $20 on a four pack. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, four pack of wine. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh. Looking at a bottle of wine, I'm looking at it, I'm like, eh. yeah. Exactly. And, the people, and the people, and the people I think who are coming in and drinking yeah. wine and buying it from the liquor store fall into a couple different categories that we don't ever hit. So you have people who don't want to spend that much money on wine, which right. we can't really match because we're so small. Yeah. And in the wine industry, the difference in scale between like us and Gallo is insane. Mm hmm. I actually worked out a a, uh, comparison of what that actually looks like. I think it was, if you put a sedan, a four-door sedan inside of the, you know where they had the Olympics in Beijing? Yeah. If you put that inside of that stadium, we're the sedan and... And and Gallo is the stadium. Sure. So yeah. the the difference in scale is, and I'm sure it's the same with it's the a classic David and Goliath. Yeah, it's it, the same. Yeah, it's the same with the brewery. You know, it's the same with the breweries and everything, yeah, yeah. right? But for some strange reason, like we have a hard time. We can't attract the customers really very well who we who are buying wine in the price range that we need it to be, right? right. So where like, we need to be selling wine, our dry wine specifically, in like the twenty dollar range, basically. Yeah. And it's really hard to convince the customer walking to a liquor store to spend twenty bucks on a bottle of Jersey wine. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 that's really honestly probably been our biggest challenge. If we can sell, if we can get a bottle in there that's going to be around 12 bucks, then we can sell that. Yeah. But if, if you're getting into the wines, like the wines we really want to produce, which are the higher end kind of finer dry wines, which take a lot of effort, they take more to produce. 
you know, it's really hard to get in that market what you need to get for that bottle. And so that's been a big challenge. Yeah. Additionally, and I think Dustin hit on this, so moving from liquor store to restaurant, you know, we are absolutely, you know, singing from the rooftops to chefs who are restaurant owners um, in that kind of dry wine, fine wine category to consider putting New Jersey wines on their list because we are the shop local. Yeah. Um, it's just like investing in a local tomato, corn, peaches, and so on. Yeah. Um, so we have had really wonderful partnerships developed over the past year with uh, including Chef David Burke, um, uh, the Garces Group. Um, we have a restaurant group in Atlantic City that I'll tell you about because I know that you're sure. on your way down there. Yeah, right um, and anything we can do to to beat that drum. Um, yeah. We need more wines also um, on restaurant wine lists. Yeah, well. uh, so that's like an end run, I think, around the problem because if right. we can get them introduced to it in a setting where it's like, oh, this is a nice restaurant and yeah. they're serving Jersey wine, then right. the whole perception issue is exactly. gone. Right. Then you just say, oh, well, like they have it here. That must mean it's good, right. you know? So then you can do the end run around the whole thing and then they go to their liquor stores and look for that bottle. Yeah. So. That I like, really like that strategy, and I really restaurants have been tough for us too. Though we've tried to get into restaurants, we're only in a few, and it's been it's been a, big, a real challenge for the same reasons. Yeah, you know, right. Well, because I'm sure, like you know, when they're buying, you know, like they're buying it. Like I'm sure the prices are different than like what I would buy at a little yeah. liquor store. Mm -hmm. Right. But just you know, at the same time, like you know, margins and all that. Yeah, stuff, right? exactly. Like you I mean you know, just mentioning like a David Burke. You know, there's certain uh, chefs and certain at least in my opinion, I have no idea if I'm learning all about the wine industry right now. <laughs> um, but it just seems like there's there's avenues to do it. And like, there's a lot of people, just from my experience, talking to so many chefs and restaurant owners and all that kind of stuff where like local stuff is important. Like, mm, you right. know, sourcing local uh, to more people, you know, now more than ever, most likely is super important because it's like the whole carbon footprint. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. You know, it's sustainability and, and all that. And I think like this is a perfect opportunity to kind of, do that, mm -hmm. you know, hundred percent. I mean? So, um, yeah. So I'm on board. So let's take our break. Okay. Uh, so it's, we're really gonna come right back. But um, so we'll hit some sponsors. We'll come back. We'll talk more about kind of like the history of the vineyard yeah. and kind of what you guys do and when people come here, what to expect, um, all that kind of stuff. So this is the Greenies from the Garden State Podcast. I'm Mike Cam. We're here with Dustin Tarpine and Devin Perry at Cedar Rose Vineyards in Rosenhain, New Jersey. We'll be right back. Voted one of the top 100 jazz clubs in the world, Shanghai Jazz in Madison, New Jersey, has been entertaining its customers for almost 30 years with world-class live music, great food, and a commitment to hospitality that creates an exceptional atmosphere. Plus, if you're in the mood for a creative cocktail and incredible vibe, be sure to check out Encore Speakeasy, located downstairs in Shanghai Jazz. As one of my favorite restaurants in the area, I personally guarantee you will have a great experience. Check out the music schedule, the menu, or to make a reservation, head to shanghaijazz.com. The Mayo Performing Arts Center is the heart of arts and entertainment in Morristown, New Jersey. MPAC presents over 200 events annually and is home to an innovative children's arts education program. To see MPAC's upcoming schedule of world-class concerts, stand-up comedy, family shows, and more, head to mayoarts.org or just click the link in our show notes. All right, we're back for segment two of this episode of Greetings from the Garden State. I'm your host, Mike Cam. We're here at Cedar Rose Vineyards in Rosenhain, New Jersey with Dustin Tarpine and Devin Perry. Um, I'm Mike Cam, if I didn't say that, and somehow you don't know. Uh, so in the first segment, we learned a lot about kind of just the wine industry in New Jersey as a whole. Uh, we learned a little bit about uh, Cedar Rose mm -hmm. to a degree, um, but I do want to make sure that we, you know, just because you're the first one doesn't mean we talk all about the industry <laughs> and not you. Hey, it's uh, okay. Yeah, so uh, tell me the story, uh, kind of how you guys got started, mm -hmm. uh, like with the woods. Tell, tell me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so basically, I think we left off with I was doing that internship in 2009. And so uh, basically I went back to back to school for another year and um, in the summer of 2010, uh, I didn't have a summer job in place or another internship, so I ended up deciding to go back and work for the same guy because it was super interesting and I was really into it. Um, turns out that my neighbor, uh, Stephen Becker, also didn't have a job. And so I asked Dan um, if he needed another worker, and he ended up bringing him on. So um, basically, me and Steve just kind of like worked in the vineyard doing hand labor, you know, all summer. And we had a lot of time to talk, as you can imagine. Yeah, right. When you're 40 hours a week and they're 50 hours a week in the field just yeah. doing hand work, there's a lot of time to have a conversation. <laughs> um, so, you know, we just were just, we were both kind of just really a little bit raptured, in rapture about the, just the fact that this industry was here and we had like no idea that it even existed. Right. And um, like I said, we had both grown up here and it was just, it was something that was just seemed like it was almost a viable possibility because like we were both still in college we were both trying to figure out our careers what we want to do when we get out 
um, Steve was studying environmental science and I said I was studying horticulture. So, you know, I was aiming for something like that, but, you know, Steve didn't have a direct idea as well. So we kind of just were just kind of talking, you know, um, and at the end of the day, uh, you know, we would, like you're saying, we, I like beer. So me and he would grab a couple of beers and we'd go and uh, back to his, his mom's house where he was living, which like I said, we were neighbors. We grew up together. So we, I lived right next door to him and I was living in my parents' house at the time. Um, and his, uh, his mom had this little piece of, uh, so it was her, her the whole property is maybe like two acres and there's this little three quarter piece of woods on the property. It was maybe like a 15 year old forest. It had been a field at one point. Um, but we used to basically just like walk through that field at the end of the day after we had been messing with grapevines all day and just talking about like, you know what, like I bet we could just cut this thing down and like, yeah, you could plant a vineyard here and yeah. just kind of, you know, just bullshit and dream in and whatever. Right. Um, and, uh, he basically went through that whole year kind of just doing that that summer. So we both went back to school, you know, and we don't, we didn't really talk too much while we were at school. He was going to Franklin and Marshall. And I was down in Clemson. So we used to work at Franklin and Marshall. Oh, really? It was oh, surprisingly enough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's where he went to college at. So he, okay. yeah, he graduated. So we, we both ended up graduating in 2011. Um, I, uh, had went out to California to do an internship, actually working in blueberries, interestingly enough, go, you know, I kind of probably gone to Hamilton. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Done right. Um, but it just, I really wanted to go to California. I, you know, check it out on the West coast and everything. Um, so I went out there and, uh, you know, Steve actually called me. It was probably a week into my internship. I get a phone call from Steve and he says, Hey man, uh, I just want to let you know, I bought a chainsaw and I started cutting that woods down. I was no shit. Like I was like, like, like shocked, you know, because like we were talking about it and stuff, but it wasn't like, you know, who knows how things like that get started, but that's, I guess how they get started. He literally one day just went out and bought a chance on his car cutting trees down. Yeah. (laughs) Right. So, um, the only way to, the best way to start is, I mean, but it's so funny because I feel like there's like, there's a lot of like complexity around like, you know, how did you end up starting this? How'd you end this? Like literally Steve grabbed the chainsaw and started cutting down (laughs) trees. Like, I, you know, I mean, that was step one. Very high level. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So pro forma. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. So he basically kept in contact with me when I was in Cal. I was in California until August. Um, and so he kept in contact with me going back and forth and like talking about, so he basically gathered a bunch of team of our friends together and they were pretty much just like cutting down trees by day and kind of like burning them by night, basically. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, for, yeah, I'm pretty sure we're, we're allowed to do that. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, so, um, So that was pretty much how it went that entire summer. So I got back in August and they had like three quarters of the field cleared, like all the trees cut down, just stumps and giant piles of brush and everything. They had a whole system. Like it was, it was kind of crazy. Yeah. And so, um, I jumped back in with them, uh, when I got back and we just did the same thing basically until the winter and by the winter, uh, you know, his dad luckily had a backhoe. So he came and kind of pulled all the stumps out for us. And, um, we actually enlisted kind of funny enough. So one of my partners now, um, Sam Pepitone, our other partner, he we actually recruited him early on to plow the field for us because he used to, he's been farming this land around here for as, as long as I can remember. Yeah. Um. So we just kind of asked him like, "Hey, can you come over and help us out?" So he drove his tractor over there, plowed the field up for us. Um. But the thing we realized is we really didn't have any money at all. <laughs> so so was most new business. Yeah, oh, and that's <laughs> right. kids right out of college, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, too. yeah so right. we um. We knew we were going to have to buy the vines. Couldn't get around that, right? Yeah. So luckily, Steve's Steve's mother was uh, awesome enough to actually go and like buy those vines for us, and then lend us the money to buy those vines. Um, and then uh, since we anything we could avoid, we avoided. So we actually went in the woods and ended up cutting down red cedar trees and turning them into trellis poles. And so red cedar, we chose red cedar one. It's an it's what you call an early succession species. So it's one of the things that grows up first, and it's very abundant. You're not going to hurt red cedar. You know what I mean? By taking yeah. it out of the woods, you're just going to grow more of it. Right. Um, so uh, also it has the heartwood in the middle is antifungal and it like mm-hmm. repels insects. Interesting. So we were like, okay, if you're going to use any wood, you might as well use that. Yeah. So look, so another fortunate break, Steve's dad on his property had some woods um, with a, a little bunch of little red cedar kind of holes in there. So we went and that winter was spent basically logging red cedar, pulling out of the woods, ended up logging 300 red cedar poles. Wow. Um, that is still most of them still standing in that vineyard so that's really cool yeah yeah um but yeah so then that brings us basically to 2012 uh where we got the vines put the vines in and then uh put the trellis poles in everything was kind of up and standing and looked beautiful and then we were trying to figure out how we're gonna make money off this thing right yes three acres of vineyard or three quarters of an acre of vineyard i mean yeah i don't know maybe you're producing like twenty thousand dollars worth of grapes if you're lucky probably right. not even yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we were like okay well we just sunk a ton of time and investment and energy into this right. so we got to really kind of make this into something um so uh we basically spent that entire winter of 2012 just kind of business planning yeah um so we got all our plans together figured everything out and um 
really almost a, a very serendipitous meeting. Um, Steve literally ran into our, our our other business partner, Sam, in a pizza shop in Bridgeton. And he gave him your stereotypical like uh, elevator pitch. Yeah, so he right. literally just ran into him and said, hey, listen, Sam, you know, we've been building this vineyard. And he knew because he had plowed it. So he yeah. kind of knew we were involved. And he told me, yeah, this is what we think the industry has some potential and it's all on, on the upswing and all this stuff. And uh, we actually got a meeting with him. And so we sat down and we kind of pitched our whole plan, our whole idea and everything. And he said, okay, let's do this. Yeah. And so then in 2013, we ended up planting this entire vineyard. So, <laughs> so yeah. we went from planting an acre and a half, uh, or sorry, three quarters of an acre, um, to planting uh, 20 acres right. the following year. So yeah. very steep learning curve. Yeah, on, seriously. The <laughs> on the learning curve side, like I'm sure... Well, maybe I'm not sure. Maybe you're just like an instant success. Um, um, no. Like <laughs> those <laughs> early years, like going from, like you said, like an acre and a half mm -hmm. to now 20 acres, like that's a huge jump. Yes. And I don't know, how did the first year go? Not that great. Yeah. So then you're just like, let's just go, let's 20 times this <laughs> and go well, even so, more. Oh, so the, you're talking about the small vineyard. Yeah, the small vineyard right. went fine. Okay. The small vineyard okay. was so fine because- I'm confident in there kind was, of yeah. scaling up. Well- there. Maybe not that much. But, yeah. So yeah. to be honest with you, we originally suggested 10 acres. Okay. And our business partner is a, he, he grows mainly row crops. So you're talking corn, soybeans. And for him to hear 10 acres. Is like is, nothing. He's grown thousands of acres. Sure. So he's like, oh, you got to put at least 20 acres. And I'm like, I don't think you realize how big 20 acres is in the vineyard world. Yeah. And he's like, oh, we can do it. So we went with 20 and it was, it was probably a little bit too much. Um, no, I don't know if I've ever heard of anyone putting in that much acreage at one time. Yeah. In the in as far as everyone I've ever talked to, mm -hmm. just because it's just we there was a point where because we were we were new to kind of like uh, you know pesticide management, so figuring out the weed control stuff and like all that, we were very new to that stuff. And yeah. we had some training from working over at Rutgers. You know, Steve was still working over there. He ended up working for a different researcher who works in vegetables, but he learned a lot about spraying and stuff. But um, no, the first year we actually had to physically weed whack the vineyard three times. The 20 acres. Yeah. We walked through and literally weed whacked 20 acres three times because the weeds got so high we couldn't spray it. <laughs> so imagine imagine being at home and how much, you know, all your listeners are thinking about what it's like to weed whack, you know, the perimeter of your yeah, property. I hate it. And then and I don't have one. But, right? Yeah. Because I cannot even. And then that you had to do it three times. We were burning out weed whackers. Like yeah. you literally burn up like multiple weed whackers where they just died. Yeah. They just burnt the engine. Like we, need, we need a weed whacker sponsor. Yeah. yeah seriously. <laughs> but so that was year one. And then to follow that, we, you know, the plants weren't in the best shape they could have been because we were still trying to get our act together. And it was definitely a little bit more than we could handle. We were still working full time jobs. So like yeah. I was working over at Bellevue Winery full time at that time. Steve was working at Rarick full time. Steve's brother Rob was working at a chiropractic's office full time. Time. Um, and then literally would leave our jobs instantly come here and work here for another like six or seven whack. hours and so yeah. we whack it yeah. literally yeah. We, we, like, yeah I mean so you know that was that was it that was tough and then unfortunately going into that winter the 13-14 winter was the coldest winter we've had in 50 years wow and so you had plants that were a little stressed out that were not in the best shape they could have been you had a lot of rain that fall, and then you go into this winter where it's icy cold, and we actually ended up losing 25% of the vineyard. Wow. So vine death, vine death, not yeah. fruit, sure. actual vine death. So we had to replant. Mm. So this block in front of you here, we had to replant most of. Yeah. The block to the right when you drive in, we had Merlot down there. It all died. Uh, so just for reference, like these ones that if people are watching on YouTube, they can, they can see them in the background. Like that vine there. Yeah. Like how long does that take to grow? So like, so you lose, like you have vine death mm -hmm. then like from replanting to like when it's actually like a, uh, you're going to have fruit. Yeah. Yeah. So you're about three years. You oh, can, you can wow. sometimes do it in two years. It depends on the grape variety. Some are more vigorous than others. Yeah. Um, but so this, what you're looking at here is Cabernet Franc. Okay. Um, so for Cabernet Franc, for instance, you can get generally a small crop on the, so if you plant it, you get nothing that year, that next year season comes around, you might get a like 25% yield. Okay. But most of the time, people just cut it off because it's better to actually have the plant develop some architecture um, in the trunk and leaves and machinery and stuff. Because you know, the leaves are the machinery of all the production of all the sugars and everything in the plant. So yeah. if you don't have enough leaves to support the amount of fruit you have, you're just not going to have good fruit and right. it's not really worth producing. Um, also, uh, actually, you just keep going. If you had more, yeah, I was just, yeah, yeah. So it's just um, so basic, totally basically, two to question. three years, two to three years, pretty much. I mean, is a short answer. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, and so. I feel like all the stuff that we're talking about so far is actually the agricultural side, yeah. which obviously you can't do anything back there without act obviously starting here, like, uh, you know, doing like growing this stuff yeah. first. Um, but I'm sure like at some point, 
there needed to be like that part of it too, like oh, the yeah. manufacturing of mm. the wine. Like you could have as many grapes as you want, but you got to actually make, you gotta wine, make wine. You're a yeah, yeah, winery, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, so take me, take me through like that process too. Sure. Um, so obviously like that's really important because mm-hmm. that's your ultimate thing that's going to make the money. Yeah. I'd say that's one of the biggest challenges of the industry just as a technical issue is that you have to put all of the money out up front. And you don't get it back for like three or four years. Yeah. Um, because you have to buy all your tanks. It's a lot of faith. You have to buy all your fermenters. Yeah. You got to buy your crusher, press, filters, pumps, all that stuff. You got to spend like a couple hundred thousand dollars just to get started. And then you're going to, you know, like I said, you better plant the vineyard. And the vineyard itself is, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. And then you have it, you know, basically from the time you get from fruit to actual wine, you're five or six years, you know. Yeah. So that's been the big challenge. But I, we started... Um, we started making wine in 2015. I okay. believe it was our first our first batch, and we started out in a smaller facility with just a little bit of tank space, um, just to kind of get our feet wet a little bit. Um, but uh, as we moved on, we moved over here into the main building. It was two, 2017 vintage, I believe. Um, so yeah, so we had to start planning for all of that and buying equipment back in 2000, basically 14. Right. Um, and put in putting putting the cash out layout for that in 14 bringing in our first, we, we actually, to be honest with you, the first crop we actually made in Steve's garage. Okay. <laughs> and that was 2014, but that was mainly just for our own consumption. Though. Yeah, right. Like, yeah. That was kind of... Well, you need to make sure that you have something that's... It's practice. You know? Yeah, I mean, yeah. like, you know, I had made wine, I had been working at Bellevue for, you know, almost four years at that point, and I, uh, I was in the winery a bit, but I'd never, like, it's different being there and having someone kind of direct you here or there and, right. and being just standing there and just having to be the guy yeah, to figure like, out where do I go? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. There's nobody there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so it was it was good as just a, a run through to kind of do it myself. Right. Yeah, even if it was like five gallon containers and that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. Just to figure out, you know, that I can walk myself through the process. I don't need, you know, need to be walked through the process. Yeah. Um, but the wine, the winemaking side, like I said, if, you know, for us, Honestly, our biggest focus is in the vineyard. Right. You know, well, just, yeah, because you just can't do anything, like I said, you like can't do yeah. anything back there without actually yeah. the grapes. And with the quality of the grapes, too. Right. You know, so the quality of the grapes in the vineyard has to be impeccable, really, to make the kind of wines that we want to produce. You know, right. so a lot of focus is on the vineyard. I kind of think my, you know, because I guess, so I'm, I'm kind of, at this point, I have a winemaking team, which I never in a million years thought I would have. Like, yeah. I have two people working for me in the winery, which is like blows my mind. Right. Because I've been back there by myself for so long just doing things. Um, but my my kind of thought process as a winemaker, you know, and, and that's really what I think of myself as. Like, I love to make wine. Like, it's so much fun. And I love to make wine. I hate the fact that it's, like, hardly what I do anymore. Like, yeah. I don't do really any actual winemaking. Right. Um, I lost my train of thought there as well. I was going, to be honest with you. You were, you were just lusting after um, the way things were. But I think you were talking about um, how you had gotten your own experience working elsewhere and then you were able to bring that home you said the first batch you made in your garage yeah 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 making the wine yeah the one thing we um decided to do was to kind of back off on a lot of inputs when i moved over here the difference between i guess what we were doing what i was doing at bellevue in here is we kind of just backed off a lot on on like what we were doing as far as additives inputs that sort of stuff just to figure out what do we really need to be doing yeah you know what do we need to be making or what do we need to be adding to our wines? Like, what are the processes that are actually required? Um, and that's been a big part of kind of learning, I guess, my own style of mm-hmm. winemaking. Sure. You know? Yeah. And so that, that's another question. Because, like, again, because we're, we're beer guys and, you know, I'm sure you get this too. Not to leave you out. But, um, like, different styles of beer, different, like, like an IPA could have 20, 40 different, like, styles or yeah, yeah, flavors yeah. Mm-hmm. or whatever. And I'm sure that's, I'm not that I'm sure. Is that similar on the wine side? It is. Um, it is, but it's more. I think those lines are more drawn in the vineyard, though. Okay. So, um, I mean, something that I realized that meant, and I kind of try to remember this, that I didn't know this when I started, but the wine that is called Cabernet Sauvignon comes from a grape variety that is called Cabernet Sauvignon. Yeah. And it's funny because I don't know that everyone actually knows that. That I seems did, incredibly yeah. basic, right? And mm-hmm. to me, it does now. But I know there. I can remember distinctly a moment where I was in a meeting, mm-hmm. and that clicked. I was like, I didn't know that. I was like, Merlot is Merlot. So like that is, that's why it's, it's just different. Like, yeah. And that's, that's, that was another part of the thing that really grabbed me about it was that, oh, like that is actually different. Like that's right. a different grape variety entirely. Mm-hmm. And you can walk through the vineyard in, during harvest and just look mm-hmm. at it and be like, oh yeah, that's clearly mm-hmm. different than that. Right. Is there a, you know, in talking about varietals, I actually was thinking this when you were talking and I thought I'm going to ask him after, but people might enjoy hearing your answer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Thinking about what you grow here and how delicate some of 
um, the varieties are. Can you talk a little bit about that? You know, how some of the varieties take more care, more time, more attention. And what do you like working with? Yeah. So we grow, we grow 16 different varieties on this vineyard. And so I think, again, that's like an uncommon thing for the wine world in the whole. Normally, like in Napa, it's like everybody has Cabernet and Chardonnay. Yeah. You know, that's what they're growing. You know, in, in New Jersey, it's like every single thing is different. Every winery you go to has a different mix and different makeup. And that allows you to kind of make some interesting stylistic choices. So, I mean, we, you know, here we mainly focus on making fine, dry red wines and white wines is kind of what we focus on. So, um, you know, that's where our process kind of, our, our process kind of goes. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is a question. Yeah. This is a callback. We're going to wind up having to do another segment after this because we haven't hit all the stuff yeah. that I want to get to That's yet. Um, so this is going to be a little bit longer episode. If that's okay with you guys, yeah, you have absolutely. the time. No, I'm good. No, okay. today's pretty um, free, actually. Cool. So um, the third segment won't be that. I just want to make sure that we can cut that and then make sure we talk about like if people actually come here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do they? Mm-hmm. Right. What do they get? Which we're getting like a taste of it. Taste uh, <laughs> because of like the different varieties. But yeah, um, like you mentioned, how like Napa they grow. Cabernet and Chardonnay. Cabernet Sauvignon and Chardonnay is yeah. what you see. Yeah. And then like here, um, you said like in Jersey, like everyone's doing like different yeah. stuff. Like For- you think that that also ties in back to what we were talking about in the first segment, maybe kind of like if I go into a local liquor store mm-hmm. and I'm looking for a bottle of wine, like there's like the buzz ones that everyone yeah, yeah, knows. Yeah. yeah. You know, like I know Merlot, I know, you know, Chardonnay, I know uh, Pinot Grigio, like yeah. that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. Um, and then maybe seeing one that I'm like, what the fuck is that? Chambers, you know, for instance. Yeah, right. Like, yeah. What is yeah. that? And you're, yeah. dream, you're drinking well, Tremonet. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No idea. I've never yeah. seen that before. <laughs> yeah. Um, and no, that's definitely another challenge too, because yeah. a lot of those big brand varieties, I mean, some of them do well here, sure. but at the same time, it's like, if you put a Jersey Chardonnay or Jersey Cap Sauvignon on the shelf, it's probably not going to sell the way right. Apple one would. Yeah. So a lot of times, honestly, the way we get around that is, um, is just kind of like a branding thing. So we will make a blend and then brand it as a name. That's not a great variety. Gotcha. You know what I mean? So we have a wine. That's 100% made from Cayuga grapes, which no one knows anything about. Right. We call it Whitetail. And it's just a semi-sweet wine that we kind of tell people kind of similar to Riesling, which it is. Um, and so that's kind of the way we get around that. But there are certain varieties, I think, that are that work really well in New Jersey. You yeah. know what I mean? I think that was more of what your question, the point of your question was, was just personally, I I mean, I we grow some weirdos on this farm, a couple. So we do grow Aberino, which is a Spanish grape variety that isn't, it's only grown on a couple other farms around the state. Mm-hmm. That's one that does incredibly well. Um, it's difficult to produce. It, it uh, The yields are a little bit lower, um, but if you can get a wine out of it, like the quality, it's a white wine and the quality of it's like amazing. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, the reason why we have 16 varieties on the vineyard is because New Jersey is a very unpredictable place weather-wise. That's true. And so you have some like hurricanes that come, right. you know, in the fall during harvest. And, uh, you know, now we can't make red wine. We have to make nothing but rosé. You right. know what I mean? You have uh, cold winters uh, that can kill back certain varieties that just can't survive it. So the reason for the giant mix of varieties on the vineyard really is for that, for mm-hmm. safety purposes. I right. mean, so that if you get right. a really like cold winter. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Risk yeah. Mitigating your risk a little. Yeah. Right. So do you find that um, as as we're talking together and we're learning a lot too, yeah. to, um, even though my seat at the table is uniquely positioned so that we're promoting to everyone come to New Jersey and experience New Jersey wine country. Yeah. What about this piques your curiosity as a as a beer drinker? Do you, do you see yourself getting a little bit more into it and intrigued? Well, yeah. I mean, that's like my favorite breweries and distilleries are the ones that are like trying new things, mm-hmm. you know? So like, We'll take, they just happen to be right next door to each other. And uh, like Ghost Talk Brewing Company in Clifton, like every time I go in there, well, I will do this week's episode too with Twin Elephant and Chatham. Like every week you go into one of those breweries, the beer list is, they may have a couple that were there the last time you were there, but everything else is going to be different. Yeah. Mm. And I like that because I like to try different things. Yep. Like I have a very like specific, when it comes to beer, like what I like, mm-hmm. and like a beer that tastes like a beer. Yeah. Like, I don't want it to have like chocolate in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Candy store. <laughs> I'm with you. Yeah. You know, but yeah. like when it comes to that kind of stuff, like, I think that that's really interesting. But then hearing you talk mm-hmm. about it and like knowing like uh, when I had the small AX, my, my girlfriend's really into them too, like pet gnats and organic mm-hmm. wines and natural wines, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. I had never tried those before, mm-hmm. but then doing that was like kind of opened my eyes to like a different type of wine that like I didn't even know existed. Yeah. Um, but then like you talking about like this, like this is really good. Like mm-hmm. I would buy this and bring it to dinner at like a BYO place. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because it's so unique and different and like not just like a staple type of thing. Yeah. So that's kind of what, um, like knowing kind of like how I like to 
try different things. Like that's why I do the show. So I like to go to different places, yeah. see different stuff, mm-hmm. try different things. Like that's that's kind of what it. I love that you just asked me a question. I know. I, I wasn't sure if I should have asked no, permission before. No, it I love that. Well, it's like I didn't a, know it was going to happen. But like my favorite episodes are the ones that just kind of like turn into like a whole conversation. It's yeah. like really boring when it's like question, answer, question, right. answer. And granted, you asked a question, but it wasn't me asking the question. Right. You know? Well, what I was also thinking about regarding um, how you and your girlfriend are going to start exploring more wineries together yeah. um, is we also have uh, a unique relationship with BYO restaurants um, where one winery can partner with one restaurant. So if you sit down and you say, oh, garbage, I forgot to bring a bottle of wine. Yeah. Well, this restaurant has Cedar Rose wines available. Mm. And that's because of our three acre mandate pulling us away from the downtowns. And that allows us to get more um, gotcha. or closer to the downtown corridor. Sure. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, okay. Let's, oh, the last question I have in this segment, sure. and we're going to take another quick break and then be back for like a quick kind of wrap up segment and then an experience type thing for people coming here. Uh, when you're, so you harvest the grapes, you make the wine, Yep. like, because I know nothing about wine, I know one of the things that I know is that, uh, like an older bottle is usually better. Um, so like, how do you kind of, you have to like, I guess, build that into your process too, or is yeah. that something that's like a little so bit separate from that's, that's kind of a little oversimplified. That's what you usually hear from most people, right? Sure, yeah. But generally people that are uneducated, like, well, <laughs> well yeah. no, it's just, I mean, it's just, you know, it's what be, it's what everyone always says, right. but, it, but so that's generally applies to certain types of red wine, right? Okay. And to some types of white wine, but on the whole, I think that I heard some ridiculous statistic that like 98% of wine that's consumed is consumed within two hours of purchase. <laughs> Yeah, (laughs) or like something absurd. It was like an absurd number, like absurdly high number. I I, I might be wrong on the actual percentage. When you purchase a single bottle, I'm not exactly sure like how they got to make it. But I think I think the point they were trying to make is that like most people, no one's putting wine down. Like (laughs) like you're buying if you're buying a bottle of wine, you're probably drinking it. Yeah, I mean, there's not very many people who are buying wine to be put down. So I would say that that applied more broadly. 50 years ago. Okay. You know, or, or 30 years ago or gotcha. something. Um, but as the, as I think the market has changed and people, like people aren't buying wines necessarily to sell or them to drink from for five years from now, the winemaking styles of a lot, a lot of the wineries have changed to try to promote wines that are earlier to drink, especially in a place like Bordeaux, where that is like, you know, most Bordeaux's, like, the common thing is like, no, you don't drink it before five years. Like it has yeah. to be at least five years old or it's not, it's going to be not drinkable because it has so much tannin. It's just so aggressive and all these other things. It takes some time for all that stuff to kind of calm down. Okay. But when you're talking about something like a fruit wine, a blueberry wine, like don't age that, drink yeah. that thing immediately. It's best fresh. Like Got the it. same with like uh, something like a Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah. For instance, that's going to be uh, like a, a brighter sort of like lighter weight wine. It just doesn't really, and then, and, and, and that's really not even like across the whole board. Because if you get a soft wine from New Zealand, I wouldn't age it. You get one from Bordeaux, I probably would. Yeah. You know, so it's it, really it's, interesting. It's all has to do with winemaking styles. Um, a lot of what the aging stuff has to do with is pH driven. I mean, if you really want to get technical about stuff, yeah. a lot of it's really pH driven. Um, you know, depending on the lower the pH is, it's almost like the gas pedal. If the pH of the wine's lower, then it's going to age for a longer period of time. Okay. Hmm. Um, so that's like a big, a big driving factor of like the, because it really it's, every wine has an arc. Like wines don't just get better, get better as they go. Even the best wines, 50 or 60 years after being made are just trash. You know what I mean? And yeah. Not all of them. Some of them can be 120 years old and still drinkable. Sure. It's amazing. That is really you know? amazing. I've, I've drank a couple wines that I've been fortunate enough that some of our, our clients have opened up that were like 1960 Madeira, yeah. like mm-hmm. in these mm-hmm. different things that are just like incredible, like you know, 40, 50 year old wines that are just totally intact. And yeah. they discovered, I think, some Madeira in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Oh, was it like they had like the base? Do you see this? Like a clay pot that it was in? Oh, that's probably like, like behind walls. If yeah. you if you check out I, uh, Discover Elizabeth, I know that um, the people that are involved in tourism up there were a part of the discovery. That's awesome. He's cool. just talking about, yeah. you know, tasting some wildly mm-hmm. old product. Yeah. But yeah, no, but it's very, I mean, the, the, the short answer to that question is very wine dependent. Certain wines are designed to be drunk young. Certain wines are designed to be aged, but every wine has this arc where it gets better, 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 better. And it has this peak where it's like, okay, five years in, it's as good as it's going to get. Sure. And then six, seven, eight, nine, it's going to start to go downhill. So really the trick is figuring out where that peak is yeah. based on the kind of wine it is and what that arc looks like. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Cool. All right, let's take our break. Cool. Um, and then we'll be right back uh, for our last segment. We'll learn like people actually come here and visit what they can expect, kind of what happens on site uh, for all that. Yeah. So this is the Greens for the Garden State Podcast. I'm Mike Cam. We're here at Cedar Rose Vineyards in Rosenhay, New Jersey with Dustin Tarpine and Devin Perry. We'll be right back. 
Bored of going to the same park? Want to try a new local adventure? Well, then check out njspots.com, your home for finding a new spot to discover right here in New Jersey. With dozens of maps to check out, local hiking spots, family-friendly places, and seasonal suggestions, NJ Spots is waiting for you to find somewhere new to explore. That's njspots.com. All right, this is the Green News from the Garden State Podcast. Welcome back. Uh, so this is segment three. Uh, we kept you a little bit longer than we normally do, but we're at the Cedar Rose Vineyards in Rosenhain, New Jersey, with Dustin Tarpine and Devin Perry. So we've learned a lot about the industry as a whole. We learned about the background of your uh, vineyard and kind of the whole process and all that kind of uh, different stuff. Um, but we're sitting out here, like I wanted to do this episode outside because we got a beautiful day. Um, and I drove all the way down here in the car and I didn't want to sit in the inside, even though the inside is great. Um, but uh, so I, but we wanted like this back here. So there's picnic tables, there's a tasting room inside, there's like a parked uh, food truck over mm-hmm. there. So um, people coming down here, like what are some times of year that they'll come down here? Um, and then from there, like what are some things that they can expect when they get here as part of their experience? Sure. Well, so we're open year round. Um, yeah, I think we usually maybe close for like the week of Christmas or something like that. But um, generally, we're open year round Thursday through Sunday. Um, so Thursday, we're three to eight. Saturday, Sun, Friday, Saturday, uh, noon to eight. And Sunday, we are uh, 11 to six. And so we do like a brunch on Sunday. So that's when we open a little earlier and close a little bit earlier. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's basically like you know, coming out and going anywhere else, you know, I mean, uh, during our open hours, you can just show up. Um, if you come out here on a, uh, on a Thursday, we might have trivia going on. We do trivia, uh, two Thursdays a month, which is a huge draw. We have like 50 or 60 people out, come nice. out and do trivia. Um, Friday evenings, we have live music every Friday, um, throughout the whole year, um, even in the winter. Uh, so a lot of times we'll actually have them right, basically sitting right behind you there. Yeah. If it's nice in the summer, if not, we'll put them upstairs and we have a space upstairs where they'll go, um, on Friday nights. Uh, Saturday afternoon, we also have live music, uh, usually like two to five ish. And then, like I said, Sunday we have, we have brunch. We also do like, uh, uh, vi- vineyard vinyasa it's called. So, uh, okay. b- once a month they come and they do yoga kind of set up out here or over in the grass or in, in the vines or everywhere. So, um, you know, you can make a reservation online. If you go to cedarrosevineyards.com, um, we have what uh, we use talk as a booking, uh, platform. So you can go on talk and book a reservation through there. Um, or you're just welcome to just show up to, yeah. you know. Um, and so we were talking, uh, also, uh, about, you said brunch and I, I think it's important for people to know, like, uh, the distinguish thing between like a brewery and a distillery, like we've talked about with other pl- uh, places that we've had on the yeah. show and the difference with you guys and mm-hmm. vineyards as a whole and wineries and all that. So like you can actually have food. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. So we're, we are permitted to actually to have and serve food um, yeah. and we do so. So we, um, we started our, our food programs going through a lot of changes. It started out pre COVID. We were just doing like charcuterie platters basically. Sure. It kind of, evo- <laughs> yeah. right. And then which was fine. We still do yeah. that. Right. Um, and then it evolved to like me back there with like two George Foreman's making paninis. Yeah. And like we did that for about six months. <laughs> um, and then I actually hired on a chef. Um, and since I had this chef, who was super talented. I, I came across this, uh, we were wanting to put a kitchen in, but where we are, it's very difficult because we're on septic and a bunch of different issues. So, um, we ended up deciding to, uh, just end up buying a food truck and, yeah. I, and I came across one online that was, you know, n- within our range of like what was reasonable. So I said, you know what, let's just do this. So that was a whole nother thing, which was like jumping off the deep end where right. it was like, okay, now we're a restaurant and this is, this is a whole nother thing than like what I was doing. Yeah. You know? Just with the, you know, you used to be so much more, so much more meticulous and like on it and everything's got to be hot and, and it's just, but we, over about a six month period, you know, through trial and error kind of built that out. So now, yeah, now uh, you can come here any, anytime we're open, we have yeah. the kitchen running and we'd have like a, uh, it's a smaller menu, but we try, I like to think it's a pretty nice menu, pretty basic. I mean, uh, you know, with a few appetizers, calamari, you know, uh, I think burgers, you know, for yeah. entries, chicken sandwiches, that sort of stuff. Right. So basic, well, I think it also, our food. Yeah. And I think it also kind of has to like kind of go well with this with your product absolutely you know yeah. like mm-hmm. you can't be doing like something crazy that does like would no one would ever drink wine with exactly i don't yeah. know that would be on yeah my head because everything goes with everything but um yeah like, i think that's like really important yep. too yeah we kept like the, kept make the, the whole experience kind of cohesive mm-hmm. yeah we actually use some of the wine in some of the food products so okay. we we um the the vintners burger is uh the wine actually what we the onions we were smelling <laughs> uh <laughs> yeah it's they're caramelized with uh, kindling four which is one of our red wines so oh. it's wine soaked and it's caramelized in wine soaked. yeah and it, it makes it a really really good burger right um, but, uh, but yeah, so we've had that program going for a while. We still do the charcuterie, which is like make your own. So when we first got started, I tried to have like these pre-made 
things and I realized so much was coming back and I'm like, this is too good of food to be throwing it away. Yeah. Um, so we went to like an a la carte system basically where you just, everything's priced individually. You just get the pieces you want and you can order a certain quantity. That's really um, and then you just, we, we build yeah. it up for you in the back and now we see almost no waste because yeah. people don't just don't buy stuff they don't want. Yeah. You know? Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's been, it's been a crazy sort of growth. I mean, when we, 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 we opened our doors here in, uh, 2018, um, in September and we started doing basically appointment only tastings. We were having groups come through appointment only doing tastings and that's where we started. Yeah. And to go from that and then just being a regular open place where people can come to, then we tried to build the food in and then we expanded the food and now we've, you know, we're in a, we're in a very different place than I kind of ever imagined we would be. Yeah. Um, I always wanted to like do the food and like have all that and, and have the tasting room. I just never in a million years thought it would happen this quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's been tough keeping up with all of it, but it's, uh, I, don't know. I guess I like a challenge, apparently. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then also, like uh, when they when people do come in and they can show up, mm -hmm. you know, do whatever um, outside of like the special nights and events and things that you do. Um, as far as like, like, uh, is there a such thing as a wine flight? Uh, yeah. So just like a glass pour. Like, how does that work? Yeah. So you can um, you can basically get wine by the bottle, by the glass, flight, or we do tastings. Okay. So um, the tastings, uh, COVID kind of screwed the tastings up. We were like, we used to basically do tastings. You just walk into a tasting. Yeah. But COVID was going to create a bunch of requirements with masks. And I'm like, this is not going to be an enjoyable experience for anybody. Right. Um, so we kind of like knocked the tastings down for a little while during COVID and started doing flights. So we have flights of three and five wines that you can choose. We have a couple of pre-made ones where you can make your own. Um, and then if you want to do a tasting now, we did bring them back. So you just have to make an appointment and, yeah. um, it's like more of a private experience, like a little bit more of an elevated experience. It's not just you walk in, you get a tasting. It's like, you have an appointment. It's going to probably be me or, you know, my assistant winemaker who's actually doing that. Someone knowledgeable who's able to do the tasting. And like talk you through a little bit. Exactly. Like what, yeah. What into that. And it worked out pretty well too. Cause I think a lot of times people did tastings just cause they, they felt like they were at a winery and they had to do a tasting yeah. and they didn't really necessarily want to be standing there being educated. They just kind of wanted to hang out with mm -hmm. a bunch of different wines. And so it's really good now because the people who want to just be on their own, ex explore the wines, you know, they can get like a flight. If they really want to get something in depth and like have a, you know, be talked through things, then, uh, you know, then they can book a tasting. And I think that's worked out really well because the people cool. who are booking the tastings now are, seem to be really into it. You yeah. Know, right. Which, which you're going to go through that, pro like the whole process exactly. of doing it. And, yeah. But I, and I, I totally get that. Like, uh, you know, like if you go to a place, it's cool to a learn the story, but also like if you're with like a bunch of people mm -hmm. and you want to just like let's just get like a couple different flights and we'll yeah. try like a bunch of different mm -hmm. stuff. You don't want to feel like you're in class or something. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, yeah. you just like want to enjoy it and then like just kind of like let your palate almost yep. speak for you and be like, oh, I like this one. Let's get more of that. Yeah, and maybe you learn a little mm -hmm. bit more about it. Yeah, and so like that's that what we that's normally what we recommend to people if they've yeah. never been here. We have a flight that we call the welcome wagon. That's literally cool. like mm -hmm. it's like a, a just a, a blend, uh, you, know, you know, a mix of. Uh, all the different styles that we make. So there's some dry whites, reds, rosé, some sweet wines, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, we, you know, it's it's a lot more casual and laid back, I think, than most people maybe realize who've never been to a winery. I yes, mean, you literally I just, definitely get that vibe. you know, it was a little bit, not that I was intimidated, yeah, but, but there's something there. There's, there's a sign. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, I like, because I've never been to one, Yeah, that's right. obviously like a little bit of a you know, like jump. I don't know what to yeah. expect. Not right. that was you guys were gonna like beat me up. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. but like a brewery, like you know, you go in, you know, you're gonna get beer, and like that's it. Yeah. You know, right. like mm -hmm. but and wine to me, just sometimes people that are like really into wine. Mm -hmm. I mean, granted, that's with anything, beer, yeah. just like spirits, whatever. But um, to me, because I'm not like a consistent wine drinker, people that are like are really into wine are kind of just like yeah, snooty yeah. and pretentious. Kind yeah. of like has that vibe, but uh, like this is. Not that at no. all. No, and it's all so the opposite. Yep. Yeah, and yeah. I would say that's more accurate. I mean, that kind of like it's kind of an antiquated view at this. Yeah, point. I think that car that caricature. Are... <laughs> like, well, just but the aging the wine, yeah. all this other stuff. Yeah, but the but the uh, that's that's an industry problem. Like sure. there has been trends in the entire industry mm -hmm. nationally of younger people not drinking wine, and the reason is because it has this weird caricature of some snooty rich guy with his pinky out, yeah. sniffing wine, Spending making some shit up. On a bottle. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's no it's uh that's the one thing I would just want people to know more than anything is that I mean it's just a place yeah. you know I mean it's just a place like any other place Definitely. where you just you could just we're open come yeah. you know so you, you sit down we're a restaurant you know we you know you get food you can hang out we got cornhole boards that we put out you can play cornhole we got live music you know it's um it's a lot more casual, I think, than the than the uh, the uninitiated novice sure. realizes. Yeah, and, definitely. And Dustin represents, you know, 
owners from all over New Jersey that truly take the intimidation factor out of oh, the so experience. Much so. <laughs> so much so. And it's the coolest farmers, thing. Yeah. And farmers first, you know, yeah. waking up in the morning, we cover a lot of business stuff before the sun rises. And then when you come and sit down at a table, most likely you're interacting with an owner. And I think that is a cool part of the New Jersey wine industry. Yeah, definitely. Um, you get more than just the product. It's a it's a full on experience. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Well, this experience has been so cool, um, and I'm already on my second glass of wine, uh, which is fantastic. This one's great too. Um, but I really appreciate you guys having me down here and setting this up. Absolutely. And giving me the Thank tour you for and, coming. Yeah, absolutely. Like I'm excited to do more. For sure. Me too. Um, and, uh, you know, like learn more about what the industry has and, and all that kind of stuff. And I really appreciate you sitting down with us oh, for absolutely. taking time out of your, I'm sure, busy day. Yeah, thank um, you. Glad to be able to and, do it. And talking about it. So um, let's hit them with some links. I know you did before with the website. Yep. Uh, let's do the Garza Wine Growers Association first. Yes. And then we'll do your stuff to make sure that's like the last thing that they hear. Sure. So the Garden State Wine Growers Association is actually New Jersey, all spelled out, wines.com. Okay. And we are across all social media platforms. Um, we also At are... The same handle? It's, it's Garden State on Twitter. Okay. Um, but if you go to our website first, yeah. you'll, you'll get to the right spot. Sure. So NewJerseyWines.com. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. And then for Cedar Rose? Yeah, so our website's going to be CedarRoseVineyards.com. And so from there, you can book your reservation um, on the Plan Your Visit page. Uh, you also have a web store on there, too. So we do ship. Um, I didn't even mention this, but we do ship all across New Jersey. Oh, and you can order right online. Um, so we do free shipping on a case. Um, so if you're interested in getting product, you can uh, try our stuff out. You can just order that right online, CedarRoseVineyards.com, and then go to the store link. Um, on Instagram, we're going to be at Cedar Rose Winery, and on Facebook, we're going to be at Cedar Rose Vineyards. Great. Yep. Awesome. Well, I'll make sure that I put, <clears throat> excuse me, those links and Instagram handles or, or social handles in the show notes. People just go click it and go Thank check you. you guys out. Absolutely. Sure. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll be talking more. Yes. I'm sure we'll be back because I want to do like a whole experience yeah, absolutely. you're like in real life not for like you know work <laughs> um don't tell work but, um, <laughs> but uh, so again so i'll make sure i put those in the show notes uh again thank you so much for yes. doing this with us today uh greetings for the is the website for the show so if you want to go check out this episode and more episodes obviously you've already checked this episode out all of our other episodes all of our other episodes uh you could do that from there um, so again, this has been the Greetings from the Garden State Podcast. I'm Mike Kim. We were here at Cedar Rose Vineyards in Rosenhain, New Jersey with Dustin Tarpine and Devin Perry. Thank you for listening and cheers, cheers to New Jersey wine. Woo! Way.